All right, welcome to the September 17th, 2024 City Council Work Session Meeting. We're pleased to bring our council meeting to the west side at the Sorensen Unity Center. This is a work session meeting during which there's no public comment. Please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments in person only. We, of course, welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114-5476, by email at council.comments at slcgov.com, or via our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website, slccouncil.com. We will now begin our work session, and our first item is updates from the administration. Uh, I see Josh Rabolio, a community liaison from the mayor's office, is here, as well as Andrew Johnston, director of homelessness policy and outreach. Welcome, both of you. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, council members. My name is Joshua Boyle, community liaison uh, for the mayor for District 1 and District 5. Um, so we'll get started with the next slide. Um, we, oh, oh, sorry. I need this for the my, my notes. Okay, thanks. Um, we remind, there, as a reminder, we encourage everyone to visit the feedback webpage at slc.gov slash feedback for regularly updated list of surveys and um, opportunities to engage with the city. Um, for public lands, we have the Sunnyside uh, Park project team met with key stakeholders earlier this month to discuss their ideas and needs for Sunnyside Park. A uh, general uh, pub, uh, workshop for the general public will be on September 18th. That's tomorrow at the Sunnyside Park Pavilion from 4 to 6 p.m. For those that are not able to make it, there is a survey available online. Uh, Topher and Richmond Park's concept design al alternatives were recently released for public feedback. Uh, this engagement phase is currently ongoing through October 4th. An open house will be held on September 26th at the Central City Rec Center from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, and as there's also a survey available for those projects as well. Uh, for pl from planning, the zoning amendments related to the recently adopted North Point Small Area Plan will be in front of the Council for a public hearing on October 1st. Uh, the proposal to update the zoning ordinance map by cons consolidating up to 27 existing commercial form-based and mixed-use zoning districts into six new mixed-use districts will have a public hearing in front of the Planning Commission on September 25th and October 23rd. Uh, the Larry H. Miller Group uh, submitted a zoning text amendment for portions of the Rocky Mountain Power Site on North Temple. The proposal allows mixed-use development up to 400 feet in height, as well as potential for a baseball stadium, among other things. The public engagement for this proposal is underway and ends on October 21st. The Planning Commission will hold a work session briefing on October 9th and a public hearing on October 23rd. Uh, and then uh, from our office, from the Mayor's office, we have some Love Your Block volunteer opportunities coming up. Both of the opportunities uh, left this month are on the 28th. Uh, you can join the Crossroads Urban Thrift Center at 10 a.m. to help in, in uh, creating a mural, or uh, in Rose Park on 8th North and American Beauty on that intersection. They'll be repainting the street calming mural, the large rose that's in the middle of that intersection. So there's two opportunities there on the 28th to uh, volunteer and you can find out more information at the Love Your Blog website on the mayor's webpage. Also, the Arts, Culture, and Event er, and, and Entertainment Grant um, will be opening on October 1st for applications, open through November 1st. There will be two information sessions, the first one being tomorrow, uh, on September 18th, on Zoom, and then October 3rd here at the Sorensen Center. And you can find more information on that at the, on the mayor's office website. Uh, this week is also welcoming week as part of that also being today a uh, national voter registration day there's a, an event here uh, hosted by the city and the county and, and other community partners from 5 to 7 p.m. here at the Sorensen Center uh, before the um, general session or the uh, formal session of council we invite you to check that out as well the mayor's office comes out to community events to table and talk with the public uh, we'll be at a couple of events this weekend at Marmalade Jam Fest and the 9th and 9th Street Festival, um, as well as 
Groove in the Grove happening next Saturday on the 28th. And then here's a list of some upcoming events over the next couple of weeks. Some are ACE-funded events uh, or city-sponsored or otherwise publicly permitted. Um, I'll, one of the ones I'll highlight is happening near City, uh, city Hall is the Afro-Utah Festival happening on Library Square um, on this Saturday and um, as well as the community council sponsored ones for Mar Marmalade Jam Fest and um, 9th and 9th Street Festival. And that is the update for community outreach. And then I'll um, turn time over to Andrew for. Let's push it forward. Hey, council members. Uh, we don't have a lot of updates today, but a, a few that might be of uh, import to you. Still at capacity for resource centers. Uh, we know that the EIM work uh, is ongoing this week at Warm Springs Park below Victory Road. And then rapid intervention work will primarily be on the west side this, uh, this coming week. Uh, Jordan, Modesto Parks, Nine Line, under the river bridges across um, north to south on the uh, Jordan River. And then Kayak Court is on the 20th outside of the Geraldine E. King Resource Center this uh, this week, as well as the micro shelter community move. Um, they're still working on the new site. It is moving uh, forward. It's uh, on time. It should be done by the end of this month, and they'll be turning uh, keys over to Switchpoint to operate it, and then have the folks move back in. Uh, a last piece is an HR piece. Um, some of you may know Michelle Hoon with the, the homeless engagement and response team. She's run that team for five years now. Uh, she's accepted a position uh, elsewhere in the city, though, so she'll be leaving us. Uh, she's going to join Angela Price in the Legislative Affairs um, Division. So uh, there is a, a, a job opening right now in the HEART program. It's posted online for folks who are interested, um, and we'll have more updates as we get more into that process. Any questions, Madam Chair? Council? I, don't know, I, don't I know have a question. Oh, oh, go ahead. I said I don't know what that team's going to do without Michelle, but I'm sure you'll find a good good replacement and exciting for her on that new position. Councilman Lopez Chavez. Thank you and congrats to Michelle Hoon. Um, will you reiterate, Andrew, how many uh, shelter beds that will open up with the state's uh, camp? The micro shelter mm -hmm. community? The micro shelter. Uh, we had 50 before we closed and then they'll have 50 when they reopen again. Uh, same buildings, probably more infrastructure than we had previously with uh, hygiene, those kind of needs in a semi-permanent sort of way versus the way we had it before but same capacity. And will they be filled with folks that are currently uh, located in shelter or will this be a very low barrier entry for those that are currently on our streets today? Most of the folks who were living there before moved out temporarily to new locations and they'll be coming back in. Um, for the positions that are reopened for various reasons, we have a process with the outreach teams and switch point to make sure we, uh, we get the right folks into that in, a, in an orderly way. Uh, Madam Chair, for another update for folks, uh, we are in the middle of September now. Within the next month, we would anticipate having uh, additional winter-only beds opening up for shelter. Uh, I would anticipate those would also be a little staggered this year, probably starting uh, beginning of October for a few weeks and then into the end of October, maybe even November, depending on how things go with the various options the state's working on. Uh, so again, next four to six weeks, I anticipate more shelter beds opening up. Thank you. Ma Madam Chair. Council Member Pui. Thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, thank you for, for the work uh, through uh, last uh, winter to pull together the micro shelter plan uh, that you know this council sort of put in you you know put in your lab and uh, you you have coordinated with the state and, and did a wonderful job to house individuals and to prove a concept and and uh, it, uh, it's uh, it's exciting to see that uh, the state saw value uh, in that type of uh, housing uh, while temporary and, and uh, different than what we used to. Uh, what we used to. Uh, it's another form of, of housing uh, that we definitely need. Uh, I, I wonder if there is a, if you, your uh, side or the state or someone is working on a uh, final report of how that micro shelter community works and the findings and uh, what went well. Uh, uh, because ultimately, uh, many of us were interested in uh, sharing that type of housing and an alternative solution with maybe other communities across the state and, and uh, proving that this, the sky wasn't falling uh, and that you know, we can make it happen and it could be a good, 
solution for the community around it too. Um, so I wonder if there is a report that you guys are working or you already have one. Uh, yeah, we've been working with the State Office of Homeless Services who's taken over, uh, the con who's taken over uh, ownership of um, that project. They have the contract out for Switchpoint to operate it, same operators before. So we have had a debrief about the first phase at the city property only, and we can talk about that, about how you like to sort of hear that. A lot of the continuity, you'll notice a lot of continuity from that phase to the second phase, so it'll be ongoing things. And there are things that were learned in that first phase um, that we probably anticipated we, we know, such as it was very temporary. A lot of the things were not meant to be long-term, and we change in the second phase. So the state will talk about that, uh, things they changed to make it a more enduring program. And we can also talk about uh, the folks who came in, maybe some demographics, consistency of who stayed, um, those kind of details. We have some law enforcement details as well about how the safety and security plan within and outside of that project went, and we can share all that with the council. I love that. Thank you. Council, anything else? All right, thank you both. With that, we will move on to item number two, Monument Signs in Manufacturing Districts Text Amendment. We'll invite Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, to the table, as well as Andy Hulka, Principal Planner. The time is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're also joined by John Anderson, a Planning Manager. This is a request to amend the zoning ordinance related to monument signs in the M1 and M2 manufacturing districts found in dis council districts 1, 2, and 3. Currently, the ordinance allows one monument sign per street frontage, regardless of the length of that frontage. The request is to allow additional signs, as Andy will explain. And uh, is the applicant with us? I, yes, okay, looks like okay, we Okay, great, the applicant is here. With. And I'll turn that over to Andy now. Great. So, um, yes, important to note, this is a private application. Yesco Sign Company initiated this request to allow additional monument signs in manufacturing districts. The map on the screen shows Salt Lake City's manufacturing districts. So you can see in the lighter gray is the M1, our light manufacturing. The darker color is M2, heavy manufacturing districts. This proposal would allow uh, monument sign, multiple monument signs in these specific properties. We would allow one monument sign for the first 100 feet of street frontage and one additional monument sign for every additional 250 feet of street frontage. Each sign shall be separated by at least 150 feet. As mentioned, currently we only allow one, so this would be a change to allow multiple, and it's intended to address current development trends where we're seeing lots of these larger buildings and longer, wider properties being developed in manufacturing areas. Um, for those who are not familiar, monument signs are a freestanding sign with a sign face that extends to the ground or to a base, so similar to what this illustration on the screen shows. We're specifically looking at these types of signs, not other pole signs, billboards, or any other types of signs. The signs do have setback, height, and area requirements. None of those are proposed to be changed with this. Only the number of signs is being considered for an amendment. This is the exact language that we're proposing. As I mentioned, one sign for the first 100 feet, additional signs for every extra 250 feet. So if a property has, say, 350 feet, they could fit two monument signs on according to this standard. When we were researching this, uh, we did look at nearby cities to see what is common, what are best practices. Other cities, a lot of cities only allow one. Um, some of the nearby examples that we found that allow multiple is West Valley, which allows one per every 200 feet of frontage. Magna, one for 300 feet. South Salt Lake and their industrial zones allows multiple, but it, it's just kind of based on a calculation based on square footages. The picture on the screen is an example of uh, two hotels west of the airport. This is M1. These are two separate properties, so it's not an exact um, example of what we're looking at, but I thought it was a good example of the typical spacing that would be allowed by this amendment. So to give you an idea of what it looks like to have two monument signs separated by 150 feet, that's basically what we're looking at with this amendment. So with that, um, that's all I have. Um, happy to answer questions, and as we noted, the applicant's here as well. Council? Council Member Dugan. 
thank you very much for bringing this up. The question is, uh, how many signs could we see on a on a given property? I mean, I, I'm just seeing if you had a thousand feet, you could end up with quite a few. Uh, and was there any discussions on limiting the total number of signs, no matter how large your street frontage is? I what I'll say is that I, we did look at one. I, I think. I, I don't remember exact numbers, but the large Amazon fulfillment center by this calculation could allow something, it was like something like 17 signs. Um, we considered putting a cap on this, and I, I think our discussion was basically that it will be self-regulating. These signs are pretty expensive, and we haven't seen interest or request for really extensive ton of signs, but I don't know if you have anything to add but that was kind of our thinking Councilmember Mono. I was just gonna say see I, I off the top of my head I don't see anything that concerns me about this but I, I guess I'm interested in okay. Councilwoman Lopez Chavez thank you I would like to echo Councilmember Dugan's comments I don't want to see a saturation of signs I don't think that's the intention of this but if we could find language that limits and condenses um, how much we're able to expand or allow to for these type of signage to be placed um, in the zoning. I would prefer that. It seems like oh, Councilmember Pui, go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are we are getting used to the the angle here. Uh, no, I, I certainly I I understand that uh, businesses want to advertise their business, and as there is a a benefit on businesses doing well. Uh, we want to be a city that uh, where businesses uh, thrive, and, 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 and I understand the value of, of the changes. Um, to me, I I'm, uh, would like to maybe explore the, the idea of uh, much like Salt Lake City plows our streets, uh, and there is a different priority on streets, and there is priority one, priority two, priority three, Meaning, you know, this major streets where there's a lot of traffic, uh, you know, they are flood burst because there's a lot of traffic and they use they have a higher function. Uh, I have less problems with more signage in streets like that. But if it's if there is an, a, a side street that you know is more residential, uh, I think the benefits of having a lot of signs in in a more of a residential area. Uh, which may be a priority three uh, when we're talking about plowing. Uh, uh, and I think it, th that's how my brain will like to see an ordinance change uh, regarding the signage. And I hope that that makes sense. This kind of, that kind of overlaps with my concern. So like if we're in an M1 zone, it's not likely to be a typical road where someone's driving up and down just looking for a place to go shopping or whatever. To me, it from what I when I read the report, it looks like the need for more signs is for this is where this particular thing enters the building. This is where employees enter the building. This is where visitors enter the building. This is where loading and unloading happens as opposed to just like get your cookies 50% off here kind of signage. Is that is that accurate? I know you showed the hotel, which again is more for directing people where they go in and out. But I, I would agree with you. I mean, I think it's not necessarily advertising for services. It's just more helping kind of get trucks in and out. How do they go? And especially when you have multiple tenants in a building. Um, <clears throat> and some of these buildings that we've seen have gotten very, very large. Um, and so if you have multiple tenants, being able to advertise at least the existence of that building and where do trucks come in, where do they go out. And, and you know, this would only affect the M1 and M2. So I know we're kind of talking about different levels, different streets. Um, also, there is other opportunities for signage. This is only going to impact the monument signage. You can still have signage on the building itself, and you can have directional signs. So this would just be impacting that one single type okay. of uh, sign. Right. Councilmember Mono, did you have something else to add? Question. Councilmember Deegan. So uh, I was in the impression that the signage is that loading docks here are not a monument sign. The monument sign was a commercial sign. This is Amazon uh, fulfillment, not uh, loading here, pick up here. Those are separate signs that are directing the, the traffic and directing people. Two different, two different signages, and those signs yeah. are allowed at every curb cut. Yeah, there's a so, directional sign, and then there's a monument sign, different right. types of sign. Now, different. if I'm a monument sign, they could use that um, to put in an arrow and right. say, but they're not going to use that because it's, it's much more expensive. 
Yeah. So the function of this is primarily when we have more than one entity functioning in a building trying to help people get to the correct location for their entity. Yeah, I would think so. The, I, the one example that started this request is the uh, Duraline manufacturing facility, which is in the Northwest Quadrant. And I, I think that example is just uh, a, a typical monument sign that looks something like this, but they wanted to have a second one that also had something like truck entrance. Um, we wouldn't specify what could or couldn't be allowed, but the, those directional signs that we were talking about, we do allow additionally, but they're they're smaller. And okay. so I think a little bit less functionality on these larger properties. Council Member Dugan, did you have something else? And then yeah. we'll go to Young. Dugan. Yeah, Dugan. I think my, my concern is just sign pollution. That's it, it, that's all it is. I know these are M1 zones, M2 zones, but sign pollution. I've, you know, you've seen those streets where it's like, you can't fit another sign on the street. I know that's not the same thing here, but that's my whole uh, concern is just number of signs. Maybe we have a maximum number of signs for a street frontage because the Amazon warehouse that needs 17 signs up there doesn't need 17 signs because it has a big sign on the top of the building that says Amazon, and no one's going to miss the Amazon sign there. So I'm, it's just the, the pollution that we're adding to the, the visual pollution that we have, and that's, that's all my concern here. I would say I think that we would share that same sentiment. I think that we want to be reasonable with the amount of signage, but we certainly don't want all of our streets cluttered with you know, sign after sign after sign. So. I just had a question. Do we ever consider um, the signs and the number of allowable signs specific to the number of entrances and exits that are available on a street front? I guess I'm thinking about it in terms of it makes sense to me to signal like, here is the business, turn in. Versus if there is no entrance and exit, it, it seems like having those additional signs may not necessarily be as necessary. Can I add on to Councilmember Young's question? Um, I have that same question, but I'm also wondering, is there somewhere else in our code where we regulate the number of curb cuts, or do we leave that all up to like UDOT or transportation? or How, how does that all work? I know it's probably different for every street. Yeah, so just to um, answer your question, Councilmember Young, um, we generally have not looked at that way with the curb cut, we could, certainly, but generally it's based on street frontage. Um, how many opportunities you have here on a corner, you obviously have more opportunity usually, and then the longer it gets, the more you generate more signage. So it's like size of property, length of property, things like that. So we haven't really considered curb cuts. Um, I, like I said, we could, and if we are concerned about limiting the number, I think putting a cap on it might be a reasonable idea if that's something the council wants us to move forward towards. Um, just to answer council member Mano, um, we do regulate the number of curb cuts you can have. It's um, in the parking chapter, and I can't quote it off the top of my head. That's but again, the for longer every street, right? Right, right. And every you know, the longer frontage you have, the more opportunities you have. Um, and that's on a city street. On a UDOT street, then it would be controlled by the state, and so they would have to work with UDOT um, to uh, provide those different curb cuts. Council, any additional questions, concerns? All right. Thank you all very much. Did, he, did the petitioner want to come up and that, That's kind of what we're asking, too. <laughs> Would you care to come up? Did we miss anything? <laughs> if you'll come up and Here speak into the microphone, that. please. And then just uh, say your name and everything for us. Thank you. My name is Charlie Taylor. I'm with YESCO. We are representing a specific client, but we have found that the code... Uh, tends to out a number of uh, number of tenants, a number of uh, clients in the M1 zone that we're trying specifically to address. Uh, your questions are are quite true as far as. Uh, Yes, the code does allow for directional signage, uh, but I, I haven't committed it to memory, but I think a directional is only allowed uh, four square feet at four feet overall height. And when you're driving a semi, you really want to be able to see something from a bit of a distance so that you know when to uh, 
turn into a specific uh, ingress. So we're trying to address that. We have uh, a number of clients that are in these extremely large warehouse situations where they are uh, one of a number of, of tenants in those. And they, while aren't looking, this, this specific uh, zone does not uh, perpetuate a lot of retail business. They do have people that need to find their store and uh, sometimes they're set back quite a bit and, and a specific wall sign uh, is uh, typically allowed of as far as calculated by the the width of the uh, lease space so sometimes that uh, and depending upon whether their specific font for their specific business is a good reader or whether it's just very fancy and fluffy and and uh, it doesn't really give a, a good a good read uh, we feel that being represented on a monument sign whether they're a single tenant or one of multiple tenants on a monument sign at least they'll have that uh, at the roadside to where they can uh, be addressed thank you council any questions for the petitioner I guess I'll just add, I don't hear any council member going this direction, but I do think some change is necessary for large properties. One, one maximum per street frontage really isn't appropriate if they have multiple ingresses and ingresses that are pretty far apart. I think that would make it really hard to know where to go. So I, I, I'll just say, again, I don't think any council members are going that. I do think we need to change something yeah. if there's a maximum cap or we change how far apart they need to be. I'm agnostic to that, I guess, or I, I don't care as much, but I, I do think something needs to change. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item number three, which is an informational update regarding the Emerald, Ridge, Emerald Ribbon Action Plan update. Uh, Allison Rowland, Council Policy Analyst, is at the table and be joined by Tyler Murdoch, Deputy Director of Planning. Uh, isn't that public lands? I have his title wrong here. <laughs> He's the Deputy Director of Public Lands. Tom Millar, Planning and Design Division Director and Michaela Maponga, Planning Project Manager. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you mentioned, this is an informational update on the Emerald Ribbon Action Plan. The plan will guide capital investment and later operations and maintenance along the 10-mile length of the Jordan River within Salt Lake City. It includes 772 acres of city-owned open space, including natural areas, parks, and golf, and the Regional Athletic Center complex, excuse me. Um, so this version of the plan concentrates on public engagement, a proposed framework for the final plan, and a five site concept and on five site concept designs. Note that this plan is, an, is in an earlier stage of development than the Allen Park plan, which you saw last week. The department plans to transmit their full draft plan to the council later this year. And it'll, it will include policy and planning recommendations, a prioritized and phased list for capital improvements, and guidelines for operations and management. Funding for, to date for this plan includes the $9 million allocated through the 2022 general obligation bond for the first phase of improvements. The department has supplemented that amount with $1.5 million in CIP and impact fees so far and future funding requests for capital and operations and management improvements will be made through CIP for general fund and impact fees and through state and federal grants and other opportunities. And finally, the estimated costs for additional staffing and programming are not yet included in this stage of the plans. So there are several policy questions listed in that staff report and I will turn it over to the public lands folks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michaela Maponga. Um, today I'll provide Repeating a little bit, I'll provide an overview of the project as well as a summary of our community engagement findings that kind of led us to where we are today in the project. Um, to reiterate, later this fall, when the full report is ready, we're hoping to come back before council and present a full detail on the recommendations that we'll be proposing. 
Uh, we'll be, we've been working on this project with our consultant team led by Agency Landscape and Planning, uh, Siglo Group as our ecological consultant, and then University Neighborhood Partners as our community engagement partner. Um, as was mentioned, uh, the Emerald Ribbon Action Plan is a little bit different from a master plan because in addition to establishing the community vision um, and like a shared uh, goal for the future, we've also included two key tools for implementation. Uh, the first being a list of capital improvement projects to utilize all of the existing funding, which includes the $9 million of the GEO bond that was allocated to the Jordan River, um, as well as some existing CIP funding. The second tool is going to be a set of operations and management guidelines that will help establish how we care for um, the existing components of the river and anything that is to come. The study area is the 10 miles of the Jordan River um, within Salt Lake City boundaries. That's from 21st South to 21st North. It includes the Water Trail, the Jordan River Parkway Trail, and all of the parks, trails, and open spaces that connect to it. Um, including the two golf courses and the regional athletic complex. In total, it is 772 acres of city-owned and managed land. Our process has been broken down into three phases. We kicked off this project at the beginning of summer last year, and that was really a data collection um, and historical context understanding phase. We also sought to discuss with community how they perceive the river today and what they are dreaming about for the future. Um, then in the second phase, which was through the winter of last year into the spring of this year, we established a framework for the plan um, and developed our guiding principles and our concept alternatives that we then had the community vote on. Phase three was um, this summer into the fall of this year where we're asking the community to prioritize everything that they've told us so far and then creating our final implementation plan. Just a summary of our engagement, each of those three phases had an associated engagement phase, um, and we've collected thousands of data points um, through this process, online, in person, workshops, interviews. Um, this, our engagement was primarily targeted toward the west side, but we've had outreach from all over the city and also some of our neighbors to the south that are traveling into the city from the Jordan River Corridor. In phase one, we focused on in-person engagement. So we held a series of stakeholder focus groups, community and resident focus groups. We held two public workshops, and we had a, an inaugural event called Dinner on the River. We invited community members and stakeholders to come and talk about the future of the river. Uh, in this phase, the main themes were that the community is dreaming of a well-maintained natural and cultural sanctuary a vibrant community destination, and a place that fosters long-term multi-general use. What was clear from this phase is that while many people see the river and they see how it's declined in many ways over the years and how their attitudes have changed toward it in recent years, they have so much love for the river and they have so many stories that they can tell and stories that they want to continue to share with their children and grandchildren. Also in this phase, we developed two reports, the first being the existing conditions report, um, and then an operations and maintenance analysis, which was a deep dive into how we're, we uh, in public lands are currently allocating staff time and resources along the corridor. Using that information, we developed three concepts um, that represent three important functions of the corridor today. We wanted to understand how the community values these really against each other because in some ways they can be in conflict. Um, the three that you have here today are really reflective of a nature concept, a culture or activation concept, and then a more connectivity linear transportation model. Um, the meandering moments relies on having a very natural, ecologically restored corridor with key points of activation and recreation. Uh, Dynamic Districts is a really well amenitized and active corridor throughout, and River Ribbons is focused again on the mobility and connection. In addition to those concepts, we also established um, our guiding principles. These provide the framework for our final plan. It was important for us when we developed these that they be simple and actionable and that also that we are using language that the community was using with us when they're talking about the river, so reflecting that language back to them. So these are to celebrate the rich ecological and cultural diversity of the corridor, connect the corridor into surrounding streets, trails, and waterways, 
cultivate collective care of the corridor, restore and enhance the river ecosystem as a peaceful refuge, and activate the corridor to create a safe and vibrant destination. And so when we went out to the community members, we actually asked them to rate those three concepts and their associated strategies against these guiding principles as metrics for success. So when we talked to community members, we gave them an opportunity to indicate what strategies out of each of these three concepts were important to them, which ones they liked and didn't like, but then we also gave them the opportunity to vote on what their top concept was, their overall preferred. Um, and overwhelmingly, we saw in everywhere we went that the nature-focused meandering moments was the most loved. Um, it's very clear that, we, that community members want to see natural restoration in the corridor. Um, and that's shown by the green bars here. Not to say that all of the concepts were not well loved. There was a lot of positive reception around all of these. But everywhere we went, meandering moments, the nature-based um, idea was winning. So overall, our takeaways are that care for nature is really the priority here. People want to, be, want to see restored habitat, wetlands, wildlife, and activation in a healthy way, in a way that's manageable, thoughtful, and sustainable in key locations that doesn't disrupt the natural feel of the corridor. Um, in addition, they want to see an enhanced trail system, and they also wanted, wanted to be very clear that one of the biggest challenges today are perceptions of insecurity. People don't feel safe on the corridor today, and anything that we do needs to address those uh, real and perceived safety concerns in order to be successful. With that, we also established the values for our action plan. So this is another um, way that we've tried to organize our framework within the final plan. Um, they solidify these four topics, and they correlate pretty directly with the concepts that we found. Um, the additional here one is care, which is the maintenance and management component. And it's shown here as a fourth bubble, um, but really the way that we're approaching care is that it's really interwoven with the other three concepts. Um, because again, we recognize that we can't do any improvements, we can't make that difference without a long-term plan for care. And then lastly, in phase three, um, we had asked folks what were their top most important strategies. And then in this phase, we asked them to prioritize against them, uh, against each other. So which ones should we be working on first? Which ones are the most important? And then we've also taken those strategies and we've applied them to five sites along the river that were identified as the highest priorities and the biggest opportunities on the river. And so that um, then became our five transformative projects. And again, nature came out on top. And I think that that's been a really exciting part of this project is that at every phase that we've gone out to community, they've, re they've told us and affirmed the same things, that nature is the most important thing we can be doing for the corridor, followed by a strong cultural element, and then care, and then connectivity. Within nature, the top strategies were improving wa water quality and creating biodiverse and healthy habitat. Within culture, the top strategy was to partner with the city, this being public lands, partner with other city departments and the state to address housing insecurity. And I think the big message here is that it's very clear to our community that um, unsheltered folks are, that the river is a home to many people um, right now. And we need to address that concern before we can start thinking about activation. Um, the second top uh, strategy here was bringing more programming events and workshops to the river. Within connectivity, the top strategies were to encourage developers to enhance and protect the trail network, and then to provide safer intersections, better lighting, painted crossings, and improved visibility. And then within care, the top strategy was to prioritize ecological res restoration, so nature again. Uh, our five transformative projects were identified, again, from community feedback around the most important priority areas where we can make large impacts, um, particularly in our four value areas. Uh, so going from north to south, the Rose Park Nature Area, Cottonwood Park, the Fair Park Urban Core, Modesto Park and Bend in the River, and G Glendale Oxbow. Um, and then you'll see that the Rose Park Nature Area and the Glendale Oxbow are more nature-focused spaces. Uh, Cottonwood Park and Modesto Park are more 
uh, culture and activation spaces, and the Fair Park Urban Core is mostly focused on how do we improve connectivity. The Rose Park Nature Area um, is proposing the conversion of the driving range into a nature area with walking trails and nature overlooks. It would expand the floodplain and allow for more habitat. And we're also suggesting that we improve the Rose Park Clubhouse to become a community center um, and adding boat ramp access. Cottonwood Park, we're proposing improved trails and amenities in the main park, better, and then a better visual connection from the both halves of the park to each other, as well as to the river. In the Fair Park Urban Core, it's really three main goals here. Uh, the first is to work with developers to protect and enhance the, the trail and the waterway. Uh, the second is to create safe and comfortable connections for the trail as it moves through this very narrow portion of the corridor, and then to establish community hubs at the Fisher Mansion and the Gatsby Trailhead. In Modesto Park and Bend in the River, um, we're hoping to take uh, a lot of the active amenities and move them to the community fronting portion of the park. Right now, there's not a lot of visual access um, from the neighborhood to the south, and this would put it right, put a lot of the amenities right at the community's doorstep in the form of a community porch, which would improve um, the visual connection to the neighborhood. And then at the Glendale Oxbow, we're hoping to create more floodplain and restore wetland um, areas with wildlife overlooks for the public. Here, we are also hoping to establish a trailhead at 2100 South. And then just to touch on the operations and maintenance plan, uh, this is a separate document that will support the implementation of the goals and strategies. Um, they will both be coming to you later this fall. Uh, the operations and maintenance plan will establish goals for the care of the Jordan River. Um, it'll set new guidelines for the standardization of natural areas and, and how we care for them. Right now, we have different areas on the river that are very similar but are being treated differently due to staff capacity or attention from the neighbors, and this will help ensure a more cohesive feel as you're traveling throughout the corridor. Um, it'll identify public pilot projects for restoration and multi-year strategies for implementation and then set metrics for success. So our final draft is anticipated in October and we hope to see you again there where we'll detail in more, um, more detail of how, what our specific strategies, goals, um, recommendations, our funding break breakdowns are. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Young. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Can you go back a couple slides to the management piece? So those districts don't align with the numbers I'm familiar with. So can you explain that? Yes. Okay. So within public lands, um, we have a different districting system than city council. And I should have noted that when I included this photo. Um, so they just correspond with our management districts, some are parks and natural lands and, and our regional athletic complex. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure we weren't missing someone. Okay. Um, and then back to the original concepts. You, you had three concepts that folks voted on. Um, yes. Thank you. So in these, I did notice on your outcome slide that although, yes, meandering moments had like the highest number, that the the comprehensive totals were, were still pretty close. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so then my question and follow-up is, noting that we had one that was noted, the kind of outcome, how are we incorporating those other components in the planning? Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, so what we've hoped to accomplish is through this, um, how we've established the values. So the way that we really like to look at it is the concepts were almost like exaggerated versions of each of these values. What would happen if we went all in on nature, all in on culture and, act, and the activation component? And what happens if we go all in on connectivity? Um, so we've established that while nature is a really big priority, they all still fit together as many of those aspects um, that are currently present in the river, people wanna maintain those and still build upon them. There's no part of that that they want lost. Um, so we're hoping to, um, in our plan, establish a number of strategies that all work to accomplish each of these aspects of the values identified here. Awesome. I just have one more. I really appreciate that. Um, 
The last thing I guess that I would ask is just related. So I think sometimes um, in my experience, like asking for community feedback, you're like, do you love nature? And the answer is yes, I love nature. And it's like, do you love riding your bike? Yes, I love riding my bike. And it's like, do you want amenities? Yes, I love that too. Um, do you love safety? Sure, why not? Like, And we can say yes to a lot of those pieces, but sometimes those components don't necessarily converge and instead can diverge in terms of outcomes. So exa an example would be like, I want all natural landscaping, but I also also want safety related to you know clear transparent you know walkways that allow me to you know feel safe as I'm riding my bike or walking my dog and that there's a balance there between those two um, I've seen a lot of the natural piece and the engagement and I love that but I'm just curious kind of that that blend of safety which is also something that we hear a lot about related to um, these particular assets what do you think about that that is, I think, been at the heart of a lot of what we've needed to figure out with this plan is, and I think that's why we've uh, positioned the concepts in the way that we did, and we truly did for this um, exercise. We didn't necessarily ask which one is your favorite, although we did offer that question. What we really asked was how well does the concepts align with these guiding principles? So how well does it meet these goals that we've established here? So there was a little bit of a having everyone on the same playing field and leveling it out. Um, one of the larger conflicts that we have within the Jordan River is that the more natural an area is often makes it very ideal as a hiding spot or a camping place. And that's a challenge that I think we're still figuring out exactly how that will implement on the ground. But a lot of it is also creating a better cultural understanding within the community around what is a natural space, how do we interact with it, how do we use it, and then pairing it with um, our strategies for how do we work together collaboratively within the city and externally to the city to address housing insecurity. So what we've sh strived to do with our um, transformational projects, I'll use Bend in the River and Modesto as an example, um, I think this is an uh, example of a location where we don't necessarily want it to be the most natural space in the world. It's in a highly residential area. It's where people want to be and where they want to have spaces to go and gather and have playgrounds and recreation amenities. And we don't want to take that away and say, you know, this is this should be a natural area because that's what we voted. We think that there really has to be a careful implementation in how we balance each of these values in each of these spaces. And as we go through the transformational projects, you'll see that there's a little bit of a different balance in each one. Um, so I think it's, it's absolutely a concern, and I think that it's still something that we have to work out and pay close attention to as we get deeper into the design of these spaces and listening to the community and where it makes sense to have those really nice, well-maintained, maybe even blocked off natural areas and where we have that recreation. Thank you. I really appreciate you reflecting how you're balancing all of the uh, different community needs. I think the one thing I'd add is that as we go through this process, noting that the city is also investing in additional resources with Salt Lake City uh, PD related to some of the safety concerns, we've had a lot of great success um, working with our community liaison on SEPTED principles and making sure that those are reflected. And it's honestly our park staff who are incredible in making that partnership happen within the city. So just making sure that those um, educated individuals have that opportunity for input as well I would just appreciate but again kudos to you in terms of finding that that balancing point where we're honoring the interest in nature while also making sure that we're creating areas that people feel safe so thank you councilmember Pui I mean quickly I you know I love to see this area uh, it, it, you know to come to a higher better life and uh, I I'm looking forward to seeing some of these aspects uh, come, you know, come to our communities. Um, and when you have the bend in the river, uh, it, it just reminded me that our city at some point uh, thought about uh, activating uh, an area and put it quite a bit of investment on in, in building infrastructure in that area, uh, a nature center, uh, an educational space for kids, uh, all sorts of different other amenities that 
over the years got abandoned. Um, and I'm hoping that we <coughs> learn from that experience uh, to say what happens in 20 years and 30 years. And, and financially, for sure, how do we maintain these things that cost more over time to maintain? But also, how do we activate it? And, and the cost of activating it? And, and how do we make sure that this is uh, a long-lasting amenity for the community? So that, to me, uh, when we're talking about it, and I know that you mentioned at the beginning that the maintenance costs are not quite there yet, um, but I, those are very important to me when thinking about this. Thank you, Councilmember Mano. Thanks, and I'll try and be fast, but I have three things. First, the comment. I have thought for a long time that the Jordan River Corridor is something that we've underinvested in, and I'm really excited to see these plans. I, to the specific things that are going on there, I think that that's uh, more appropriate for the council members that represent that district and the neighbors to give feedback, and I know you're getting that feedback. I'm excited for that, but I uh, have voted for and will continue to vote for investments in this corridor because I think it's such an underutilized gem in our city. Um, my question is related to funding. I know that there's some bond funding. I know that the city's put up some funding. To realize this whole vision, are we halfway there? Are we a tenth of the way there? Like, what do you imagine for us? And I'll give my comment after the It is hard to say without our full funding recommendations out yet. It's far from $9 million. Um, I'll say that within our first phase of projects, we're hoping to accomplish um, certain aspects of the transformational projects. It won't be in each, we won't be able to conduct work in each of the five uh, locations, and we won't be able to complete anything to full build out um, that we're showing in any of these diagrams right now. This is meant to be a visionary, longer term um, implementation. Great. Well, and I'd be I'd be interested at least to know for budgeting purposes what it would take to get at least something in each of the five. What I, I know that we're probably not going to get all of, like you said, not all of any of them. Certainly not all of all five. But it'd be great if we could get something in each of the five. I'd be interested in at least knowing what that would look like from a budgeting standpoint. My comment is I really really dislike the name. <laughs> because it's confusing and I think that we've done this before in the city we had station center and central station in RDA and we ended up going back and just changing one of them to the Rio Grande district because it makes more sense and people understand it I really think we should just call this the Jordan River vision plan or something like that because Emerald Ribbon and Green Loop are too similar and people are going to get confused so that's my comment take it or leave it all right Councilmember Dugan Madam Chair thank, thank you for the uh incredible work reaching out to the community. I liked all the, the number of uh, respondents and how many people you've actually engaged with. And I, I love the energy that you provide. And when I saw you the other day over here at the Sorensen Center, it was beautiful because there's a lot of people, a lot of chatter, and just minds are going everywhere. So I really appreciate all the engagement. And I love the vision of this whole plan because I, as Councilmember uh, Model would say, this is, has the potential to be an incredible, uh, beautiful, amenity for the entire city, not just the people that live right next to it, and, but everyone can go there and just enjoy it and just ride their bike, do whatever they want to, kayak, the whole line. You have five projects. They all seem to me to be big in their own right mind. So, and kind of touching on Councilman Mano's point of, you know, we could spread the peanut butter and hit all of them and maybe we won't do them all well, or are you guys thinking about going starting north to south, south to north, center to out, of focusing on one of the uh, five locations, doing that real well, learning from that, and then just building from there instead of spreading it out and then having five under construction and spreading the uh, awful, also the, the staff and everybody else around. So is that st still in your decision-making tree at this point? Yes, we're still determining what will be the first phase of projects, and those will go into implementation right at the beginning of the year. We'll start working on getting out, get, getting consultant teams on to start designing engagement for the projects that we uh, need to move ahead with most urgently. Our goal really is to be a little bit more equitable in our distribution geographically because that is something that we heard from community members out there. We want to make sure that there's a sense of fairness. It's not just that one part of the river is getting better and the rest of it we don't want to touch. Um, I will say that there's a 
breakdown. I'm not sure where we've quite landed on it yet, but there's a breakdown between what is going to the transformational projects and aspects of those five, and then also a portion that will be going to kind of corridor-wide projects, things like signage and improved rest stops and improved connection points at intersections. So there'll be a sense of intervention everywhere, um, even if it's not necessarily the biggest um, transformation. Great, thank you. Michaela, can I tag on to that real quick? Cottonwood was allocated as part of the GEO bond. So is that, that one is being prioritized because that's a not insignificant portion of that funding has been secured. Is that accurate? Yes, that okay. we're going to be kind of matching some of the Jordan River bond funding with the Cottonwood Park bond fi funding okay. to do a portion of work there. Perfect. C Council Member Wharton. just want to um, emphasize, too, that I, I would like to see um, an investment in every zone as well as Council Member Mana was saying, but I would, before I would like to see that, I would rather see more consistent maintenance um, and see like an overall upgrade along the full ribbon. Um, so, so it's not that I disagree um, with what Council Member Mana was saying, it's just that I, we've had a lot of conversations about maintenance and I really feel like that needs to be the number one focus. Um, and from when I talk to residents that use um, the Jordan River Trail, that I think in, in my experience is what I've heard emphasized the most. So yeah, I just wanna keep um, the focus on that maintenance and, and an overall upgrade of that whole corridor. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you. And there was just one policy question about the Fisher Mansion. It's kind of mentioned and touched on in the, the overall plan, and there's funding for the upgrades at the Fisher Mansion. How does that play into the uh, your plan across the board as far as the upgrade and the, the location and the work there? So the vision for um, the Fisher Mansion within this plan is really just have it be a place for community activation, a place for the city to maintain some kind of public use there. Um, right now, as you mentioned, the stabilization project is underway, I think um, going to construction very soon. Um, and we're working with the nonprofit Friends of Fisher Mansion to, do, to establish a broad vision and set of goals for what the end use of the mansion can be. Um, I think our next steps within public lands is to continue working with the Friends of Fisher and establish um, what the community wants to see, what our partners want to see, and then be able to go out and determine what is the right way to fund and find partners for the full renovation of the mansion. But I think we're all aligned in um, it basically trying to ensure that there's a public use in the mansion. Madam, Madam Chair, it's please. worth to note that on, on Fisher uh, that the stabilization will not uh, mean that the building will be ready to be open doors. There is going to be a request to, to uh, for us to remember. There is going to be a request for future funding to fulfill the vision that uh, we come up with. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, can I talk about communication with neighbors? So if you are one of my constituents who frequents the Cottonwood Dog Park, you have only had half of a bridge to use since the tree fell on it. Um, and we've had vague promises that it'll be fixed. It, it is technically functional, but I really think while we're, we've gotten really great at soliciting feedback for our plans, we have not at all cracked the code on continuous communication with our neighbors while it's going on. And especially as I look at it, I've already told you all, I, I really do love the new conceptualization for Cottonwood Park. Um, and I love the reorientation of the bridge. But for people who use that dog park, who live up on 500 North to walk their dogs in the morning, we're adding you know a good five, 10 minutes to their morning routine. We need communication with them. We need them to understand what to expect, and we need to set rational timelines. Do we have a strategy for constituent communication yet, or is that something that we can expect to see delivered? It's an excellent question because they're not just Cottonwood, but at several other sites, there are obviously grand plans in the action plan, and there are many existing needs, deferred maintenance needs. And, and we do need to do a better job at communicating that, yes, these things 
uh, are in need of fixing right now, and these other things, or maybe the same things, are in need of longer term, more strategic thinking, uh, but we definitely need to do a better job on that Cottonwood Bridge project. As soon as we got to the point where we realized, uh, well, it happened simultaneously, when we realized what the design was going, or rather what the designed bridge replacement was going to cost, and then putting together some estimates on what additional funding we would need beyond the, the funding that had been allocated, then this project and the bond funding came online. And, and I think, again, I'll, I'll own this, in not knowing where the bridge was going to be or, or what it was going to be, um, I sort of put a pause on saying, oh, we're going to spend, you know, however much it might be, six, seven hundred thousand dollars to replace this bridge when maybe in four or five years we're going to have to take it out and put or put it somewhere else or b rebuild a brand new bridge. Um, but as far as the communication around that goes, yeah, we need to do a better job of that. I would really like it. And Councilmember Pui, I hope I'm not overextending you. I think I would really like it if we were able to be conduits for the information like put in our newsletters yeah. or given to us when I, you know, the, the average constituent doesn't understand the difference between the legislative function and the executive. And so we get yelled at for things <laughs> equally. Josh Rebolio and I get yelled at together all the time. We're totally trauma bonded. Um, and so, um, you know, having more access to that information so we can be accurate conduits because, you know, even until we took the tour the other day, I was like, no, the bridge is going to be replaced. And, and now I'm like, oh, well, this is an update that actually could inspire enthusiasm. It's the sense that we're languishing and that the homelessness crisis is never going to leave us because it's, we're the epicenter. You know, all of that combines into a lot of exhaustion. And yeah. so, you know, I, w I don't want this project to get mired down with that baggage. So if we could keep that up, um, that would be a point that I would, I'm happy to put any information and any updates about this into my newsletter and to make sure that we partner in getting accurate information out. Right. We'll do that. We appreciate that partnership offer. Um, council, any other requests, concerns? All right. Thank you all so much. With that, we're going to turn our attention to um, a, a similar arrangement of people for a Glendale Park progress update. Uh, Tom Millar is going to stay where he is. And Kat Andra, planner, is going to join us, um, as will John Roitis, Senior Engineering Construction Program and Projects Manager. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Hello again um, for giving us the time to update you on Glendale Park today. Uh, my name's Kat Andra. I'm the project manager for kind of all things Glendale Park. And I'm joined by Tom Millar, the division director for the planning and design team in public lands. And then John Ruedas is our senior construction manager in the engineering division that's going to be managing the construction of all Glendale Park improvements. Um, so we're here to give you updates on kind of three separate facets um, of Glendale Park improvements today. So we're going to start with uh, construction of phase one. Um, we are really excited to have our contractors on site um, working to deliver the first phase of one of the largest park redevelopment projects the city has seen in decades. Um, this first phase, which is being constructed on the west side of the park, so it's adjacent to the current Glendale Neighborhood Park, um, and it includes an iconic flagship playground for all ages, including assistive technologies for inclusive play. Um, and we're also excited to deliver several, several opportunities for community gathering and recreation throughout this area of the site. Um, I'm going to give John a quick second now to just kind of update us on the construction of phase one. All right. Thank you, Kat. It's good to be here with you today and to talk about the construction and where we're at with that on Glendale. So like Kat said, um, phase one of this uh, park will include a unique destination playground, a full-size uh, basketball court, pathways, pickleball courts, and Kat will get into that a little more in detail after this. Um, also some areas for public gathering, picnic areas, um, and some open lawn, as well as parking that will uh, facilitate parking for the entire park. Uh, the construction budget for this first phase is $9.8 million, and that comes from park impact fees, 
as well as the Parks, Trails, and Open Space Bond that was passed in 2022. Uh, the contractor is currently on site as of early, earlier this month. They were able to mobilize and they're out there now. Um, we're working with them on getting ready to uh, move forward with uh, demolition and clearing and grubbing. Um, we anticipate that the park will be open to the public sometime in the summer of 2025. And that's the goal as of right now. We're also excited to be setting a new sustainability standard for the city at Glendale Park um, by pursuing site certification. So sites this is very similar to uh, lead for building standards. Um, what it does is it really applies to the, the site and the landscape, and it allows us to um, reduce water use, really manage stormwater runoff more efficiently, enhance biodiversity, protect critical ecosystems, improve air quality, and increase recreational opportunities. This will be the city's first site certified project, and we're going for uh, gold level certification through sites. Uh, we're really excited about this opportunity to really set a, an amazing standard in the city, and not only the city, but the state. This will be one of the first um, state certified uh, or site certified projects within the state. And we're also excited that this is part of the, this, the west side of the city, and we're, we're excited to be uh, a part of that. I'll turn uh, more time over to Kat to talk about the pickleball courts. Awesome. Thanks, John. Um, so as, as part of phase one, we're also repurposing some of the tennis courts at Glendale Neighborhood Park into pickleball courts. Um, based on what we heard through several periods of public engagement, um, we heard from the community just the huge need for pickleball, um, particularly on the city's west side. And so during the vision planning process, we incorporated four new, new courts into the vision plan in addition to our current tennis courts. Um, since then, with some additional engagement, we've determined that we could deliver far more courts with far less money by repurposing some of the existing underutilized tennis courts that are currently at Glendale into pickleball. Um, so this project will take four of the current uh, tennis courts at Glendale Park and resurface and repurpose them into 12 pickleball courts, um, which is sufficient for tournament play, community play, um, and we're doing our final reviews of the design now. We are at 100% um, and are anticipating getting a contractor on board by the end of 2024. Um, we're on track to construct early next year with the courts being open to the public in conjunction with the completion and opening of phase one of the park redevelopment. Um, we're really excited to have been able to increase this number of courts proposed at Glendale Park um, by reutilizing these current tennis courts instead of constructing new ones. Um, and we're really eager to open up the first pickleball courts in the Glendale community as well. And some of the first on the west side, we have Rosewood now, but we need some in Glendale. So um, that is upcoming. Yeah. Um, look. Um, we got a question on a, on a I, I believe it was a KSL article about the Rosewood uh, pickleball opening a couple of weeks ago. And they said, you know, how many pickleball courts do you have in the city? Where are they? And uh, we've, we've produced this statistic a couple of times for a few different people but in looking at it again with fresh eyes the realization we had was before september 5th there were zero mm -hmm. pickleball courts on the west side and there were i think 12 or 14 on the east side east of i-15 uh, by the end of next year with rosewood with glendale with fire station number seven and with poplar grove two-thirds of the city's pickleball courts will be on the city's west side Yeah, the, uh, pickleballs. I, I wish, uh, you know, there was a, uh, you know, some speakers outside this building so some of the neighbors uh, know about, you know, what uh, you may happen from their feedback. Uh, and it was, a, it, it was a huge moment for my community to see that they were able to shape this plan that for a moment it felt like it was close, right? And, and we were like, okay, we we're ready to go. But the community then realized again to to go back to the communication issue uh that with with our communities on the west side that we needed additional engagement that, uh, to know that my community has the most active pickleball group in the city and probably in the region uh right here um, and they played from a couple of blocks from here uh, from a church and um, there is lines uh, of neighbors playing every weekend and they have uh, tournaments and they travel all over the state to play and they are frustrated that there is not uh, in their own neighborhood. Uh, and so this is a huge win for the community. I want to acknowledge that. And, and it's, a, it's a huge win uh, for, for them to organize themselves and, and flood us with 
feedback uh, and, and demand that we could do better uh, and public lands acknowledging that, opening the, the, the public engagement and receiving that feedback. So thank you for that. Thank you because it means a lot to my community. For the neighbors that uh, are still continue frustrated, continually frustrated about that the city doesn't listen and that we still are disconnected, this is a good example of, of them shaping these projects. I, I also want to, I have a quick question re related to the site certification. This is the first time I heard about this piece. Um, and again, not, you know, the concept is fantastic and I love that. I just worried about cost. I wonder if that's going to throw the budget away since we already sort of, you know, creating a regional park with not you know, necessarily all the funding lined up. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that we're not all of a sudden deviate, deviate, you know, changing the goal uh, and adding another goal with the same amount of money. Um, and the third piece of the question uh, relates to the timeline. And, um, and it connects to setting the expectations correctly to my community and acknowledging that things do happen and change. Um, none of this presentation acknowledged that the timeline is delayed. Uh, and to me, I think it is... Uh, and, and to your point, you guys showed up to the community councils to tell them that it was delayed when the community councils were asking, why is there nothing happening in the site? Uh, so thank you for going to those community councils and saying, we have uh, hit some roadblocks, we have some issues, here are the issues, but we are moving forward. Um, but to me, my community on this west side require us to be transparent about these issues and communicate more. And to the point brought up here by Councilmember Petro, uh, we'll love to be a conduit to this information and tell, hey, this is happening. No one is to blame. These are the issues. We're still moving forward. We're, we're a few months behind. Um, and just to build trust, because trust is key here with the community on the west side. And I wanted to make sure that that is acknowledged. We are behind. Um, but we are moving forward, and we are, uh, you're not, your team has not stopped uh, finding solutions for these things. But to me, it's important to acknowledge that piece. Um, so those very long questions. That's <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple more slides, but I want to acknowledge all three of your points, I think. Um, one, this pickleball project has been really exciting to me. It is a testament of like the change that a strong community passionate about something can make in the plan. Um, we had a, basically an adopted master plan and we're able to improve it and make it better to serve the community because of community members and their input. So this has been really exciting and we've been able to move it along really quickly. And um, yeah, just uh, very excited about that. Um, in terms of the site certification, um, we throughout the master planning process, we did pre-certify the site um, for sites certification. So we have been accounting for, you're, you're right, um, the sustainability standard does come with some cost implications, but we have been planning for that since the beginning of the master planning process. Um, and then I did just want to kind of put a plug in for the new sustainable, sustainable infrastructure policy that the city just passed where construction projects over 2 million kind of explore the opportunity to integrate sites. And so I think this will be a really good um, example and I think provide a lot of lessons learned too for how we can plan at the very beginning of a project for costs and for potential timeline increases that might come along with um, this policy so um, we're excited about that and taking lots of great notes throughout this whole process um, and then third thank you for bringing up the timeline um, you're absolutely right we are a bit behind from when we initially anticipated and we have been trying to be transparent with some of the folks um, that have participated, but we have contacts for people who have initially been interested in the plan. We have the community council, but yeah, we would love to take you up on your offer to kind of distribute that to the broader community. So um, yeah, we would love that. And I, I anticipate with a project of this size, um, we have, this is like the first huge project of the scale that we've done in a long time. And so I anticipate things will always come up and so we'll definitely be transparent with you and keep you all in the loop as as this timeline changes as well. Um, I have a couple more slides just on next steps for phase two and then lots more time for questions. Um, but we are, as these construction projects are playing out, I think we understand there's the huge remainder of the site still to be built out. So we're working on design of phase two of Glendale Park, which will substantially build out the remainder of the footprint on the site. Um, currently, we're working on finalizing the design, design team for phase two. We're anticipating having schematic design, so a high-level kind of conceptual design for the entire remainder of the park along with cost estimates. 
for what the remainder of the entire site will be to build it out um, by spring of 2025. We will then move forward with detailed design for elements that we'll be able to pay for with the remaining bond funding, so funding that we have in hand right now. Um, and then the remaining, uh, which is about $20 million from that bond, and we are anticipating requiring additional funds for the full build out um, when we'll know more in spring 2025 of what that number might look like. Um, but throughout the design process, the design team is also exploring opportunities to bridge the potential funding gaps that I'm sure will come along with this. Um, for phase two, we're looking at repurposing old water park infrastructure to create new amenities for park users. So including um, old pool infrastructure for skate parks and skating features, old slide pieces into placemaking features throughout the site, um, and then the wave pool as an amphitheater for concerts and events. Um, we're also really excited to coordinate our efforts with the Emerald Ribbon Action Plan that you um, just heard a little bit about to celebrate the Jordan River and kind of make strides in building out this citywide vision um, and having Glendale Park kind of be a conduit for that. Um, and then we're also excited to be working with the Arts Council to in integrate public art into phase two design. Um, the iconic West Side art is slated for Glendale Park and we're really excited to be working with the Glendale community um, to kind of celebrate that identity and Glendale Park as an iconic West Side amenity. So that's kind of everything, all things Glendale. Um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you so much. Thank you, Council. I will look for questions. I'll go to this side first since I went there last. Council. Can't Councilwoman hang Young hang and oh. Oh, Mano then Young. Sorry. I just I can't wait to hang out in that wave pool amphitheater. <laughs> <laughs> Nostalgic. <laughs> Love it. Kat, um, I'm curious about the phase two site. Um, can you, sorry, this is apparently my theme of the day. Can you just talk to me about like safety and security of what's happening over there until we get to that space of being able to design it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, some of the delays for phase one construction have been due to site security. And so um, the city has been great with working with our partners to kind of tee up phase one um, and get our contractors ready to go. Um, phase Two, we are working with our parks team who is working with the Ritt and Hart teams right now too to work on a security plan for phase two. I think of particular concern when phase one opens and we're inviting people into the site, we need to have a really good solid plan about how to secure the second phase of the park. So um, we are working on um, personnel potentially to um, be on the site and what that might look like, uh, physically securing the site with fencing, um, it will be park's obligation to kind of make sure that that is uh, up to par when we open phase one. So throughout the whole construction process of phase one, um, we're coming up with sec a security plan to make sure that phase one is safe to open. Awesome, thank you for that. I appreciate thank that. You. I To your point, I think it's important um, as the community starts to get excited for September, or, you know, the summer of 2025, when we expect to see phase one open, um, that we are in a space of being able to also be secure with the part of the um, parcel that's just, you know, coming soon. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, can I ask, how do we, we've now, this is now the second really beautiful idea that we have that does not have enough dollars behind it. And there's another really big one that repeatedly gets a lot of attention. Um, how do we prioritize <coughs> finding, securing, and executing the funding and plan when we have this many balls in the air? And I'm particularly nervous because I we've heard horror stories from around the world of the the guillotine that is an Olympics. And in my worst case scenario, what happens is we do enough that it's something that it wasn't. We have too many competing priorities for our capacity. The funding is difficult to secure for all of them. And we end up with a couple hastily bandaged products that are good enough. And then the Olympics come and we all breathe it, take the sigh of relief that we need to after something like that and we never find the thread again. What is our strategy on this one, since it's the one that's in front of us right now, but literally all of them, since like Allen Park, we talked about this, not sure where all the funding's coming from that. Fisher Mansion, we talked about, not sure where all the funding's coming. The Emerald Ribbon, 
uh, any green loop. At what point do we say, and, and, and let's not forget the deferred maintenance everywhere that we've, this is not a fault of, of you all. I'm not trying to lay, but I would like to know that there's some kind of North Star in decision making. Um, or I need to know if I need to do my statutory role and start pulling reins more heavily and trying to persuade three other people to agree with me. It's an excellent question and one that we grapple with every day um, <coughs> on the day-to-day -day side simply because we have uh, more needs than we have projects and we have more projects than we have people and and that cascading effect definitely impacts the the service that we're able to provide to the public but I think what doesn't change is the the level of park service that the public either requires or demands from us and and what they have asked us for in the reimagine nature public lands master plan through constituent cip applications i mean i think that is an excellent form of community engagement where we really hear from people as to where we are lacking or or where we need to to make up the uh the the slack um one thing that we are working on right now is our strategic capital acquisition and asset management plan, which will, for, for the first time, maybe in, in, uh, in recent memory, give public lands the ability to program five and 10 years out, not so that we have more projects, but so that we're thinking about the timing and the size of those projects more strategically. And it isn't just a matter of, Oh man, this big opportunity came. Let's let's take it, or let's prepare for it, or let's you know let's not say no to anything. Um, I think it's saying yes to the right things, and then making sure that because we have a plan and it's not just year to year that we're able to then staff up appropriately, not only on the design and planning side, on the construction side, but then also maybe even more importantly on the operations and maintenance side. I think that'll be a, a transformative step for us, so that it does not turn into a every 10 year cycle where we're just preparing for the next big thing and then leaving a lot by the wayside. One other thing I'll say about the Olympics is, yes, the Olympics is a wonderful opportunity, I think, to show off, to showcase who we are as a city, but none of the projects that we are doing in public lands are for the Olympic goers, if I can say that out loud in a public meeting. Um, they are, they are taxes and they are impact fees and from the people who live here and work here. And we want to be sure that um, every project that we're doing is obviously acknowledging the reality of the Olympics, but that we are building something that is going to be much more durable than just the next 10 years. One thing about Glendale and our bond projects that is particularly important to me is making sure that we are not wasting any time in getting those projects done because the amount of funding available and the uh, contractors that are available are just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as we approach 2034 with as much infrastructure as needs to go in elsewhere in the state. We want to make sure we're getting as many of those done as quickly as possible so that we don't then get caught in the, you know, the spin cycle of those last five years in preparing for the Olympics. Thank you. It feels like that's a pretty grave responsibility for us to be guardrails. Councilmember Pui. I, you know, I thank you for, for that question. I, I just, uh, obviously to me, when I'm thinking about these major things that are coming to us and, uh, you know, gigantic projects, not only this year, but this year in particular, right? But in the last few years, the decisions that we have made or we have been involved uh, will have an impact uh, for decades, uh, and, and uh, they were not easy uh, to discuss. Some um, might think that you know we decided on, on you know and very fast without thinking about everything and, and having a million questions and in many cases, you know, too many meetings about everything. Uh, and, but I uh, let me tell you, I I love these plans that we discussed earlier. I love uh, the community engagement and getting uh, the community to tell us what they want to see from our city. Um, I also like to dream big, and it's important to dream big, and it's important to 
set the expectations high for ourselves, you know, you know while at the same time not uh, over-promising to our community uh, on things that we cannot deliver. So that, to me, is an important motto. Um, but ultimately, I also want us to balance it up with finishing what we started. This is one of those that is not a plan. Yes, there are phases of it that are still on the planning stages, but we have told the community that we're building a regional park like we have never in you know, 30 plus years, um, that we, we are going to do this, and our administration, the, the administration and ourselves committed ourselves to get it done. So to me, this one, uh, and we bonded in, in, in big part because of this one, that we wanna get it done. Um, so uh, there are two pieces to this, uh, is the finishing what we started and maintaining what we have, uh, and then uh, planning and dreaming big. But not to confuse the community sometimes to make sure that they don't think that everything that we plan, it might happen immediately. So, because it might not. And, and we need to be clear with the community uh, just because it, it sometimes we set the expectation and, and we don't want to, you know, uh, just uh, jade my neighbors a little more. So, but thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Lopez Chavez. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to look back and remind us I'm really excited by uh, the regional park, uh, but I want to make sure that every project is articulated as tied back to our urban forest and growing it densely. Um, I'm excited about different projects that are coming online, in particular in the downtown, because it really is going to enhance what currently doesn't exist today, which is an urban forest or urban canopy to help cool the center of our city. Uh, so in future, uh, you know, in, in, in kind of future reporting, I'd love to see how you can tie back to the Urban Forest Action Plan. Um, I would really like to understand that and just, again, identifying our plans on, specifically with our tree canopy, how we're going to maintain and acutely be aware and report back the tree growth uh, versus the tree loss that we've seen, especially here in the west side. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, just a couple of things on that. And I, I'd be very interested in tying that specifically to metrics in the um, uh, urban forest f plan. So I would definitely be interested in doing that. In terms of the site, um, we are we have a really unique opportunity at Glendale. There are massive mature trees that are somehow super, like pretty healthy still on the site. And so as part of the um, site certification process, we are really prioritizing the health of those trees and maintaining them. Um, and we're, I think, something like quadrupling the amount of tree canopy on the site itself. Um, and that's the really cool thing, I think, about sites, too, is it does put us as a design team on the hook for measuring certain metrics, um, being held accountable by a third party to ensure that we are actually doing our part to maintain the trees that are currently on site and then kind of delivering our promise for what we say we're going to do to improve um, the natural ecosystems. So, um, but yeah, great comment. Thank you. Council, any other questions? All right, thank you all so, thank much. You so much. Thanks. All right, Council, we now are standing at our break time. Uh, let's take until 4.05, please, <laughs> and we'll meet right back here. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, the next item on our agenda is a Great Salt Lake restoration presentation. And uh, we have Jesse Stewart from Public Utilities uh, who's going to lead that. So, Jesse, go ahead. All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me again. Um, some of the slides I'll show are the same as the ones from a couple weeks ago when I presented briefly with the mayor's update. Um, I've tried to throw a few others in there. I've got a small video I'll show you all. Uh, time lapse, uh, a lot of graphs showing the lake elevation, and then I'll end with kind of some long, larger local, state, and federal initiatives and what Salt Lake City is doing to do our part for Great Salt Lake. Um, this first image here you can see uh, that shows three different colors. The lightest blue, the biggest one, that's the largest extent of the lake uh, in 1986. Uh, the dark blue is the lowest elevation of the lake. That was a couple years ago in 2022. And then the medium is uh, the average. We're someplace between the smallest and the second smallest. That's where we're sitting right now, so we're still below average. Um, here, I'm gonna so hit escape, you said? Sorry, he just told me how to do this, and I was, I've already forgotten. Jesse, okay. Jesse, could you 
Is the middle blue, is that the uh, 98 to 204 uh, numbers as far as elevation? Uh, let me go back to that. Okay. Let me show this. So this is, a, let me play this one more time. This is a time lapse from 1984 to 2023. And this just shows um, how the lake has changed in elevation as you go forward and ups and downs. So pretty, pretty dramatic. It's, it's, it's um, again, we're about five feet below where we want to be as far as optimal lake levels. Um, let's see how we can get back out of this. I'll, and then I'll back up to the question you had here. So what was your question again? The uh, middle blue, is that the uh, 98 to 204 number elevation-wise? Uh, it's just the average number. The, the so, so, but is that would be, that would be 4,198 to 4,204? Um, I'd have to see if I can, it's just, it's 4,200 is what it is. Okay, okay, yeah, 4, that's 4,200. Yeah, okay, 4,200, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I wasn't quite getting that question. Sorry about that. Um, so we just saw this again. This just that was again a time lapse from 1984 to 2023. Um, it showed the high in 1986 of 4211, uh, the low in 2022 of 4188, and then the target range uh, based on what the states put together is 4198 to 4205. Um, you can see on some of these next graphs, that's not where we are right now. Right now we're at 40 4192.6. Uh, this is from 2007 forward shows the north arm and the south arm. The north arm's a little bit lower. That's the causeway, the UP causeway that splits the two. Uh, if you ever fly into Salt Lake, you can see the color differential there really well and know exactly where the causeway is. Uh, this is a great um, illustration from the uh, um, state's strategic plan, which I'll show you here at the end. And this just kind of shows the different elevations where if you get too high, you've got adverse effects to high levels. Um, we got a healthy lake lake level, that's again the 4198 to the 4205. Um, the transi transition zone where there's some adverse effects. And then you can see where we are. I put I put a, a couple days ago's number in there, uh, 4192.6. That's where we're sitting right now. So we're definitely in the adverse impacts. So we're still have a ways to go before we get up to that healthy lake level. Um, it's not going to happen in one year. It's not going to happen in five. It might take 30 years to get there. Uh, we had that big snow year a couple years ago. That did a, that was huge for the lake. You can see where it was there on the far right, uh, way over here, where it actually rose quite a bit uh, with that big snowpack. Um, that would have done better, but we were, were coming out of such a drought, and we're still in a drought, that we were filling reservoirs up high, and we were filling the groundwater. So not all the water got to the lake at that point. So we still, get, we still got a ways to go, but I think uh, what the state's doing and what the various stakeholders are doing it's a path towards there, but it's still going to rely on precipitation and some work on everybody's part. Uh, this is another look at just the different elevations and how they've broken it down by um, what's, what's the optimal range for wetlands, uh, for biology, whether that's brine shimp, uh, birds or mammals, um, land use, they didn't put a lot of into that, uh, recreation and economics and safety. So again, these are just different ways to look at the elevations and what are the healthy, healthy levels. Um, one thing that's not really on here, and we'll talk about later on, is um, every foot of elevation is roughly 74 square, square miles of open um, um, dump mud flat. So if we're five feet down, do the math at 74, 74 miles times five feet down, we got you know 300 to 400 feet or 304 uh, square miles of open uh, mud flats to cover up. Again, it's such a shallow lake. It's you know 33 feet. It's max. It's about 75 miles by 35 miles. It's a, it's a big area, and again, every inch covers a lot of ground because it's just so shallow. I don't know if you've ever been out there, but go out when you go out. You either go into the deeper sections in a boat, or you're on an airboat for the rest of it. Um, I don't want to talk about Great Salt Lake without kind of showing the regional area. So I showed this one last time. This is just some of the other reservoirs in the area. Like I mentioned a couple years ago, we were filling those reservoirs. Those reservoirs are at a pretty healthy level right now. Uh, so we're not gonna be starting off at a deficit. Uh, so we go into next year, next uh, spring runoff with some full reservoirs. Again, we still need a snowpack to top those off and then we'll have runoff to contend with and everything else. But again, it's not like it was a few years ago where those were pretty low and the soil moisture was pretty low. We're in a better state than we were then, but we're still not out of a drought. Again, one or two good years doesn't doesn't alleviate all of our problems as we go forward. 
But again, these are all the inputs that come in. About 70% of the inputs to the lake are from uh, the bear, the Jordan, and the Weber. 40% um, of that comes from the bear, and then 30% um, of it comes from the other two rivers, and then the rest are direct precipitation and uh, other some groundwater and then some of the smaller creeks that come into it. And then a big exporter of water from the lake, if you think of an exporter, is just evaporation. And that's where we get the lake effect. We get some of the great snow here in Utah. But there is, you know, a, a lot. I, I have to the number up. It's a lot of evaporation that comes off of that just because it's such a broad area. And then you get our hot, hot Utah summers and that shallow water, it's already warm and it's going to come off pretty quick. Uh, this is another uh, graph from the same strategic plan. Um, you can see these are some of the total depletions. So the top one's the total depletion, and this is an acre feet. Um, think of an acre. An acre foot is if you have one acre of land, put a one foot of water on top of it, that's an acre foot. So it's one foot of water on top of one acre of land. Uh, so you can see the total up there at the top is about 2,000 um, acre feet, 240,000 thousand acre feet. That's what that means. So... Um, and then uh, you've got agriculture is the, really the biggest uh, factor that keeps water from going to the lake, the diversions there. Uh, you get some reservoirs up high, and then M&I, municipal and industrial, that's us down there in the kind of reddish color. And then you've got mineral extraction down a little bit below and reservoirs a little bit below that. So agriculture is by far the biggest one. And then M&I is probably, you know, 9% I've heard, but 10 to 15% is probably about what it accounts for. Uh, so now let's think about, this is a really busy slide, and I won't read all of it, but we, I'll go through some of the top points. So this is kind of the local, state, and federal priorities and what they're doing. And you see on the, that graphic on the right, that shows a lot of the state divisions. You've got division of air quality, division of water quality, oil, gas, and mining, water rights, water resources. So a lot of stakeholders in this. Then you've got Army Corps of Engineers, REC, EPA, Fish and Wildlife, USGS. And then you've got all the local municipalities and the special interest groups, whether it's Audubon or Friends of Great Salt Lake, that, that have a stake in this and are all taking part in this long-term effort uh, for a strategic plan for Great Salt Lake. Uh, some of the near-term things, and some of these are near-term, mid-term, and long-term. And long-term can be up to 30 years. So near-term is things we can do initially, and then some of the longer initiatives that will take some time. Uh, so stakeholder coordination is one of the big ones. This is something the state's focusing on is it's not just Utah, but the Bear River also comes from Idaho and Wyoming. So you've got three different states involved in Great Salt Lake here. Um, then you've got the numerous divisions I talked about, all the municipalities, including Salt Lake, and then the special interest groups. Um, they're working on funding strategies, whether it's the Great Salt Lake Trust or other funding strategies to pay for studies and investments or to pay for you know ways to get water in, whether it's um, people making it available for people to to uh, put their water rights towards Great Salt Lake. And that's something Salt Lake City is doing with our effluent. And then we also are um, working to make sure that that can be part of our long-term strategic planning. So as our 40-year plan, it's not just water for culinary, but it's water for Great Salt Lake as we go forward. Um, regional and conservation goals, there's a lot there. There's secondary metering. There's a lot of uh, municipalities that have secondary water uh, that can be metered. It's pressurized. Weber Basin's a big one there. Um, we do some irrigation from Utah Lake and Great Salt Lake. Uh, only a few of our customers have pressurized systems there. But that just gives better accounting for that water. Um, landscape conversions, again, whether it's like flip your strip or doing some zero scaping or something like that, there's a lot of initiatives there. And statewide water saving devices, there's metering, both metering what's going into the lake and then better metering for uh, secondary water or culinary water just to get a better accounting of things. Um, growing water smart, water banking, a lot, of, a lot of different things that can go into that long-term planning. Uh, there's strategic plan, the management plan, there's cloud seeding. So there's a lot of plans and modeling that are going to take place. Um, we'll talk about the, the strategic plan and management plan here in a second with Salt Lake City. Laura Briefer is on the steering committee for that, and I'm part of some of the, the technical groups for a lot of this that's going on. And then dust monitoring is a big one in modeling because that's, like I mentioned, there's a lot of mud flats that get exposed as the lake goes down and then get covered up as it comes back up. Um, agriculture incentives, I mentioned that's one of the biggest depletions. Uh, there's conservations there, whether it's uh, drip irrigation or um, something other than flood irrigation that has, isn't always the best uh, water conservation. Water quality is a big, big initiative, whether it's salinity, which impacts um, the brine shrimp industry or mineral extraction. 
or um, any or the the brine shrimp itself or anything else the, the fish and wildlife there. Uh, wetland management and invasive weeds. So Phragmites is a big issue out there. They're kind of a hydrophilic plant. They love water. They suck some of that up, and it doesn't stay in the in the lake that way. And then water availability. That's really one of the big ones. How to get water into Great Salt Lake, and that's that's something that's a big initiative for this. Whether it's uh, water banking, um, water modeling, cloud seeding. We we partake in some cloud seeding, and that's becoming more of an initiative for the for the state itself. And then water banking, what, what's available to get water there? And conservation is a big part of that also. Um, air quality, that's a big issue for this whole valley, whether it's from dust or just the air quality we have. So that's a big initiative also is to help quantify where that dust is coming from and then put mitigation efforts into place. And a lot of these are just, at, they're at the very first step, so there's not a lot of, I won't be able to give you a lot of detail on this, but it just to let you know that this is the initiative as we go forward. Um, and then the ecosystem for migratory birds or brine shrimp, whatever it might be, and then that also hits the economy as we go forward. Um, Salt Lake City's efforts. Uh, conservation's a big one. Uh, we've been doing conservation for, for decades now. Um, our baseline was from 2000. I'll show some graphs here in a second. Uh, we've already seen a 25 to 30% reduction from that baseline number as we've seen populations grow, so we've still seen a decrease. Um, we've also do things like Salt Lake City turf trade, We've worked with USU to develop a special turf that some of the golf courses are using. We're using on different uh, pump stations. We actually had a tour with several other water districts came to one of our pump stations to see this, this uh, new grass we put in, and they're going to be doing that also. Um, and then we've got our city water assessments, and we've got water checks and water maps going forward. Uh, we're also looking at dedications to Great Salt Lake for our reclamation plant effluent. Um, we've got our participation in the Salt Lake City Advisory Council, uh, like I mentioned before, Laura serves on the steering committee for the Great Salt Lake Integrated Plan. Um, we're looking at options to include Great Salt Lake in our long-term water management. Like I said, having a part of our strategic plan, not just culinary water, but water for Great Salt Lake. And then uh, there are many state and local initiatives related to GSL. They're outlined in some of the plans. Um, the technical group, again, I'm a part of that, and there's a lot of, a lot of very technical groups where there's a dust forum council or a modeling for groundwater or model flows water flows and then we're like you know we're very involved with water management all the way from the colorado basin uh through the provo system utah lake jordan river and all the way up to great salt lake uh, so that's again our, we're a public water supplier we've got our provo river water users utah lake water users and then there's also a utah lake study that i'm on the steering committee for that one as we go forward because it's all tied together it's one big one big system uh, the figure shown here, I circled that yellow part. Uh, that's where our water reclamation effluent discharges into Farmington Bay. And really, we're one of the bigger contributors to Farmington Bay right now, depending on how water's managed at the surplus canal. Uh, we can be one of the major contributors to uh, Farmington Bay of Great Salt Lake. Uh, this just shows a couple of the graphs so you can see our kind of water use up there on the upper left. Uh, blue is where we are today. That's this year. Uh, light blue is that 2000, year 2000 baseline, and then it's kind of a running average, so 21, 22, 23 is that red line. So we're a little above the, that average, but we're well below the baseline level. And then down here on the bottom is some of our conservation trends. So you can see there's different uh, ULS conservation goals, the state conservation goals, and then even on the far right, uh, the new conservation goals. And you can see our trend line is already going way down. Um, we're down about 30% in, um, in use, and in metered sales, we're about down 36%. All the same while, we've had about a 12.5% increase in population. So that's going to be a continued effort for us. Um, these are some of the slides I showed last time. If you want more information on Great Salt Lake, the state has some really good information out there uh, on this one. This is the strategic plan, like I mentioned, that Laura is a big part of. Uh, this is where I got a lot of the... the the data for this presentation and some of the slides. And then uh, this is another really good reference from the Utah Geologic Society. And again, this ends with that same graphic that was on the front, which shows um, high level, low level, average. And like I said, we're somewhere between the small and the medium level right now. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Council. Councilwoman Lopez Travis. Uh, thank you, Jesse. And really excited for this council. We're going to pass a resolution tonight at our formal meeting, the Great Salt Lake Resolution, highlighting uh, not just 
public utilities in Salt Lake City's efforts, but also these citizen-led initiatives that help us, one, better educate the public, but two, to just remind our departments of the priority that we have uh, in our efforts to grow the flow, as we say. Uh, Jesse, I wanted to ask, in some of these forums, have we had enough data articulated to um, start to strategize what dust monitoring might need to be mitigated, particularly in our Westside communities? So I'm, I'm not sure it's gotten to that that level. There is a dust forum. Um, I can I can send some information on that and, and lead you to those pages. I think, like you said, some of this with the strategic plans that are going forward, they're still pretty pretty new. Um, I, I I would probably be better to than to try to answer. I could direct you to those, but I can send that those links to you with the Great Salt Lake Dust Forum. Thank you. Councilmember Dugan and then Councilwoman Young and then Councilmember Pui. Thanks, Jesse. And, and I, you know, just my hats off to Salt Lake City and the residents and, and also the public utilities for the, the great efforts we have put forward on our conservation uh, and on all the programs that we have out there. I really appreciate that. Now, there's two big programs that the state is leading out on, and I'm just curious on uh, where they stand right now as far as funding. Uh, or actually three. The first one is uh, just the secondary water metering. I know we don't, as a uh, water district, we don't have very many secondary water metering, but that's a big uh, an big proponent of uh, wasted water because they can, just by metering it, we could save a lot and of water. There, there are funds available, so a lot of the, the districts or the canal companies or the, or the local locations that are doing that have, have tapped into that state funding. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's pretty hefty. I'd have to look up the actual number on it. And then the second one is, you know, that you talk about the irrigation of the, of the uh, crops and stuff like that, and we're behind the, uh, the, the best practices in, in water conservation and for irrigation. Mm -hmm. And are we, do we have funding, a lot of funding available for farmers at this time? Yeah, so I think that the, I, I don't want to be quoted on this number, but I think there's $40 million right now for agricultural improvements. And, they're, and we're, we're, we're also, they're tapping into that at this time too, the farmers? Uh, the, yeah, the, the state's actively working with the agricultural community on that. And then the third, and I know this is all outside of Salt Lake City and outside of Salt Lake City Council mm -hmm. stuff, but it, it all impacts us because it, it's, it all does, yeah. you know, the dust mitigation mm -hmm. doesn't have to take uh, as, as a strong of a position because we're going to have water there. Uh, so the next one was just uh, the water banking or the use it or lose it. Now we do probably have uh, water right uh, users in Salt Lake City that probably have a lot of water rights that they use it because they're going to lose it. And how is how is that going? And, and how is that affecting our? How would that affect our water? And at basically also just the water. So, going so to Salt Lake. I'm not sure it'd be water rights or water shares in companies. Some some might be water rights. Okay. Um, but again, that's something that uh, I know Laura and the and the committees. I think she's chairing a committee on this right now to figure out how to make that a, an actual allowable use. So Great Salt Lake would be part of that use, and it would be a beneficial use, other than you know growing alfalfa or something like that. So that's that's an active initiative that's taking place right now. And that's that's just up in front of the state legislators at mm -hmm. their at their because that yeah their yeah, she, responsibility. I guess. Yeah. So yeah, the the group that Laura's with is the state uh, committee that she's working with, and that's one of their initiatives is to how how can we make it easier for people to put water dedicate water to Great Salt Lake instead of what would historically have been a beneficial use. Because I, I can see us having, we have some probably big water users that could, the lake and the city would benefit by allowing them to donate to. Yeah, uh, as an example, this Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District just recently, I think there was a press conference on this recently, um, started last week putting about 140 to 150 um, CFS, cubic feet per second, towards Great Salt Lake for the end of the season. And that's just water that was available that they were able to dedicate to Great Salt Lake. And that now it's just a matter of shepherding it from Utah Lake to Great Salt Lake. Yep. Councilwoman Young and then Councilmember Pui. Thank you. So I just have two questions. The first one's a historical one. When I looked at the original graph uh, related to lake levels, it was clear that we had kind of hit our high point in the mid 80s. Um, was there, and then we, we had a significant drop. Can you just remind me of what? led to that significant drop was it environmental human caused combination of both so i think this again i can't i'm not going to be able to speak directly to this but a lot of this was just climate and how the how drought the drought was kicking in okay i'm not sure it was a lot of more diversions but it was just uh, climate related 
Yeah, thank you for that. So it kind of leads to my second question, and I'm sure it's a part of some of those great plans that you highlighted. Um, but obviously, this is a question of like both inputs and outputs um, in terms of what's coming in and what we're then, you know, later on diverting out. Yeah. I know that the city efforts focus on both um, in terms of how we can be thoughtful, especially from the, the input component and then looking to the state to help govern some of the output uh, components as well. I'm just curious that as we evaluate like the policy efforts there, um, do you see inputs versus outputs as being a bigger contributor to outcomes? So let me let me clarify one thing too. So the the outputs would actually be diversions on rivers before they get to Great Salt Lake. Okay. Thank yeah. So it's not coming. It's not things coming out. The things that come out of the lake are really mineral extraction mm -hmm. and evaporation. But the what I'm talking about the it's just a lack of input. It may be a big way to say that. Okay. So it's whether it's agriculture or municipalities that are taking water from, you know, we take water out of little cottonwood, put it into our pipes. A lot of it's consumed. A lot of it goes back through the rec plant. Goes back out there. So um, I, it, it is a matter of inputs, outputs, if you want to put it at that. And again, I think what the goal now is to, to find ways to make water available to the lake. So I think a lot of the plans, that's one of their primary goals, is to be able to have more water available to the lake so that it's, that's either through conservation efforts with agriculture or better, best management practices with agriculture, so you don't need as much water on your crops, the rest stays in. And then I think back to what you were saying, that would be a beneficial use that can stay in the creek so it can get to Great Salt Lake, and it's not a use it or lose it sort of thing. So it's it's, it's very political, yeah. and this is something I actually wanted to talk about. So there's, there's kind of five tenets and some objectives, and they are whatever solutions they are, they have to be economically, ecologically sustainable, economically viable, politically possible, so that's another part with water rights, um, technically feasible and then legally sound. So what, what can be done within the legal framework or does the legal framework need to be changed? And then the objectives are, from the short term objectives are coordination amongst all the stakeholders, basing decisions on good science and then uh, um, maintaining water quality and air quality and, and ecological and human health quality. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, it kind of, yeah, it all kind of wraps it. around and it's very, it's just one big circle that this one impact, impacts this all the way around, and it's, it's, it doesn't have an end point. It's just kind of goes yeah. back and forth where they all in, in, interact and in, impact each other. I appreciate it. The tenants and the objectives are really helpful, and so I appreciate you highlighting those. Um, and again, just echo the words of my colleagues. We appreciate the stewardship that you show related to all of the efforts that you've taken on Salt Lake City's behalf to be contributors in this this space. I appreciate that, and I appreciate what you're all are doing tonight to pass a resolution too. It's it's wildly important to this valley what happens with our, with Great Salt Lake. Councilman Ripley. Yeah, thank you for the update. I I I uh, it's actually commendable to all of our residents that we have been doing better uh, mm -hmm. while we are growing. Um, and I, you know, this presentation made me wonder, and I'm far from a water expert, um, so many of these things uh, that I might say are maybe stupid, so, but. Uh, join, when, join the club. When, so. when, and I also, you know, the, the complexities of water law are just fascinating mm -hmm. and, and shockingly complex. And, 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 but again, none of those I'm going to touch right now. But limit, when we're talking about evaporation, we talked about evaporation in the lake, uh, but we, the city, we maintain uh, quite a bit of reservoirs ourselves. Uh, I wonder if there is benefit for us also to look into how do we limit evaporation in our own reservoirs on the goal of, you know, keeping more water in our own uh, system. So, so reservoirs, there are some ways to do reservoirs, like with the, I don't know if you've seen the black balls, mm -hmm. people put in reservoirs. I think some of the reservoirs are too big for that. Uh, some of the small ones might be beneficial. Um, one thing we do, and anywhere, even with our canals, we lose a lot of water through evaporation. So there's a, with canals, we can either box them, we can put trees over them, but then you get roots coming into them, so it kind of, you know, catch 22 on trees and roots. Uh, but again, I think evaporation is one of the big things, how to, how to limit that. And it's, with Great Salt Lake, I just found the number, it's about 2.9 million acre feet a year that comes off in evaporation. It's, an, it's a gigantic a amount of water that comes off. I mean, that's about 950,000 million gallons, something like that. 
to so that's a big number that's a lot of water and ultimately it is, is all about also you know the second user of water is our system because mm -hmm. we need to drink water and yep. uh, and i i'm interested in our city to keep on leading on practical things our neighbors could do mm -hmm. um and uh, i will love if updates on the gray salt lake make it to every single resident through their water bill yep. um uh, you know so they know that we that their impact on water uh, affects the Great Salt Lake. And I wish that our bill could also illustrate some of the things that they could do. Um, and the state used to have a program that I brought up a few, a few times here that they discontinue, which is upgrading the smart sprinkler system uh, so we're not wasting water when we yeah. shouldn't. Uh, and it's connected to the internet and stops watering. Uh, you know, today I received a notification, yesterday I received a notification that it was not going to water my my plants because it was going to rain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's a good way of saving water. Unfortunately, the state discontinued this program. Uh, and I wish, you know, we could potentially help and um, bring in some pieces of this program for our residents so they can upgrade their sprinklers, uh, their sprinkler system controller. Uh, like we used to, but ultimately, I, I hope that our neighbors could see the, salt, the Great Salt Lake in their build too, or or something similar. Yeah, so I, I think some of the initiatives the state has is how to do how to do better metering or better better water management um, appurtenances, and that might be something we could put in. One thing that has really helped us with our with our conservation, I believe, is the smart meters we're putting in, because people can have instantaneous look at their bill, and they can be there can be you know, some notifications that oh something looks odd maybe you have a leak so those sorts of things but i agree i think anything we can do to get people more um cognizant of of their water use in great salt lake is is great all right council anything else thank you so much okay. thanks all right we will now move on to an informational update of regarding the reconnecting communities grant John Larson, Director of Transportation, will join us at the table, as will Joe Taylor, Transportation Planner. Gentlemen, we'll turn the time over to you. We are really excited and grateful for this opportunity to talk about this exciting project with all of you today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Joe, who is our project manager. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks for having us out today. Um, so Reconnecting Communities is a U.S. Department of Transportation grant, discretionary grant. Um, its intention is to uh, sort of heal and repair those communities that have felt the adverse effects of transportation infrastructure. Um, Generally, this means interstate freeways, um, but they've expanded it to include things like heavy gauge rail, like we have in Salt Lake City. Um, this grant was awarded to Salt Lake City for $1.9 million. Uh, the match total is 3.7, uh, more than a year ago. Um, but just to give you a sense of where we are in the process now, the um, RFP closed yesterday, so we're actually moving forward. Um, we're sitting in Glendale, so this historic context is probably a lot of uh, recap for a lot of folks. Um, but the heavy rail in Salt Lake City came through in the 1870s, predates a lot of our west side neighborhoods. Um, it was mostly farms at that time. Um, but it has continued to dictate, dictated and continued to dictate the patterns of investment in the city. Um, up there is the historic redlining map for Salt Lake City. You can see that a lot of that red and yellow area which is uh, designated for uh, underinvestment or risky investment, is west of the rail, uh, railroad tracks. Um, I-15 and 215 came in later, 50s and 60s. Um, it further disrupted these communities and also made this transitional space near the rail um, you know, less, less of a safe, comfortable place to be. Um, I do want to note that both the Intercontinental Railroad and Interstate Freeways you know, have been wildly successful in accomplishing their stated goals. Uh, they move goods, people, and services across the country in a way that was not possible before they existed. Um, but they also destroyed or impacted a lot of local communities. Um, and that was just considered kind of the cost of doing business at the time when that stuff was going in. Um, so, you know, in these um, 
communities, west side communities that are affected by this transportation infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in agencies that provide infrastructure, and you know that distrust is frankly pretty well earned from the historical context. Um, and just in the kind of speaking with folks, doing outreach that we have done for other projects as well as leading up to this, uh, it's clear that this physical divide as well as the psychological divide in Salt Lake City is still very much a part of the fabric of Salt Lake City. So uh, the goal here is a community conversation. Um, we are really intentional about being solution agnostic as we enter this process. Um, we want whatever solution or solutions that we come up with to come from our citizens. Um, and this isn't just, uh, OK, this is what you said you want. We'll try and build it. But working through every proposed solution to talk about adverse impacts, gentrification impacts, who benefits from development, uh, second order pollution impacts, that sort of thing. Um, so the first thing, or one of the first things we're going to do is form a citizen advisory council. Uh, it's stipulated in the grant that these folks will be paid for their time, uh, acknowledging that, that their expertise as citizens of Salt Lake City and those that are impacted by transportation infrastructure is a necessary and beneficial part to the project. Uh, and so they'll be paid for their time. Um, and then those folks will direct much of the rest of the project, uh, including shaping the more broad, uh, broader engagement plan. Um, I'll get to the numbers in the last slide, I believe, but uh, community organizations are also to be directly included and have a set aside dollar amount for their participation. Um, and then, you know, of course, we want to just stipulate that we want everybody's opinion, so we're not going to say who can and can't participate. Um, so that'll be citywide, online, and in person. Um, this is sort of a layout of, of the scope of the project, uh, the things we'd like to, to accomplish, or sort of the definable things we'd like to accomplish, which is you know, to begin by really get a community consensus on what the actual problem is. I think it's easy to see you know, sort of the first wave impacts you're trying to get from west to east or vice versa. Train arm comes down, and you have been thrown you know, a curveball in your day that may be at best annoying and at worst detrimental to, to your life. Um, and then we want to get you know, a real kind of broad brainstorm of whatever solutions folks think might work, um, and then work with, with the community to go through all of those, looking at how likely they might be to build, what the second order effects are, and of course, how they relate to the defined uh, problem statement. Um, and then we want to choose a solution or a program of solutions and design that to the level where we uh, believe we could seek funding for it. Um, I also want to highlight that, you know, a really important aim of this project that's not specified is um, we want to bring as many folks as we can that want to along in this process so that in future transportation or, or really any other civic processes, there is you know sort of a community of folks that come up around this project that are empowered in the sense that they understand how transportation projects are delivered from you know ideation at the regional phase all the way up to to the construction phase um, and you know, just sort of understand what what our strengths and what our constraints are so that um, they can better advocate for themselves so this is a rough breakdown of, of the grant um, it's 3.7 million dollars uh, about half of that from USDOT uh, our friends at UTA are kicking in a pretty big chunk and then the rest of it's coming from the city um, 225,000 is dedicated to CBOs. Uh, that is not to say that we can't go beyond that. I suspect we will. Uh, $90,000 dedicated as per the grant to an artist or a uh, group of artists. Um, we have yet to define whether that is a piece of art or uh, part, you know, art through engagement. Um, but that will be something that we work towards as we are moving forward. Um, Hope to have a kickoff soon as we have uh, closed the RFP but have not done selection yet. Uh, so we're hoping for a two-year process following that. Um, and then I'll just acknowledge that our friends at, at the state DOT um, are the direct recipient of the funds. Um, and so they're going to do federal compliance for us. I will take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Council. Any questions? Council Member Pui. Just curious about why the timeline of 24 months. Uh, it, it, certainly, you know, the, um, the federal money will be gone if, if 24 months is the, when the results come out. So 
we're going to end up with a report that tell us that we need to do billions of dollars of improvement and no funding source. So I wonder why that timeline, and if there are, if that is the timeline that we need to abide, and if there are, if there are uh, smaller uh, metrics or goals that the report could be given us that we can use for applying for funding. Because ultimately, while this, getting this grant was a huge accomplishment of, of the administration, it really was huge to get this. Uh, and apply, um, building this wasn't easy, and, it, and there's a lot of agencies involved in it. So to, to your team, thank you for going through all of that. And I know that the, administra the federal administration was also delayed in accepting all these applications, and they had their own challenges. But I'm really concerned that we're going to end up with a report that tells us we need X, Y, and Z in billions of dollars, and then we have no, because we don't have that money, as you probably know. Uh, and so. I wonder about this timeline. Yeah, I think that we built the timeline around being as honest to the grant application as we could. Um, and I think that we just didn't feel like we could honestly have the conversation we set out to have in a quicker timeline than that. That said, and, and I will also point out that, you know, part of this uh, work will be to lay out a process for funding, whatever we come up with. Um, capital reconstruction dollars obviously are a you know nice tie-in and that would be really great to get and I think if we see that slipping away as as we proceed we can certainly you know work towards that in the meantime uh, but it's not the only thing that we would be looking at to go after um, yeah it, 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 it is a concern for sure um, I'll weigh in a little bit on that as well um, <clears throat> the 24 months is that's to finish up the entire project, but there there may be some projects that would be ready to, to peel off and start where we could start searching for funding ahead of that timeline. I'm, I'm really hoping that that's possible. Um, but I'll also note that um, the Reconnecting Communities program, it's, it's brand new. Um, and, uh, and Joe actually just got back from a, a Reconnecting Communities Summit that was in, um, along with um, Heather, who's our planning manager, uh, and this was in St. Paul. And this program is, it's, it's really taking off. And just this idea that um, we can finally start healing divides like this all over the, the country, it's really taking off. And um, I mean, none of us know exactly what the future holds, but I feel pretty confident that um, it, this will have a different flavor in different and future administrations, but I don't think that this is going away as 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 a program and as a thing nationwide. Uh, and so, um, what whatever flavor of funding is available to us, we will aggressively go after it. How are we choosing the the constituents or the people who will be participating in this? Um, especially when you're speaking about West Side communities, like I need you to hear from a single mom who has paid late fees to her daycare because of those trains, right? Not just someone who comes from an, a 501c3 who is very well intended, but especially on the West Side projects like this, always come in with amazing intentions and the impacts have very rarely, if ever, aligned. And so the, picking the participants feels like a pivotal moment to ensuring that the data we're collecting is accurate. And then my second question is, how does this align with any infrastructure asks we're going to be making in accordance with um, the Olympics? I'll take a shot at your first question, and then John might be better off for the, for the second. But um, I think that our representative board we're really considering separate from our relationship with these CBOs. And so we are really looking for that kind of lived experience as the expertise that we're seeking. Um, and so, you know, I think it will be something that folks apply for. We'll try and make that as easy as we can, um, at least in Spanish. Um, and that one's lived experience and their relationship to this divide is really what will be considering um, we're looking for 
you know, not just their expertise, but frankly, access to their networks. Um, I think that we, as a transportation division, are getting to understand what our blind spots are. Um, maybe kind of our first baby step in being better at engaging. And so, you know, I think that this is really, really important to get right because these are the folks that are going to, frankly, tell us what's wrong before we hear about what, what we need to fix. Um, yeah, and I'll say that was something that um, as we were working through on the, the scoping uh, and finalizing everything with the RFP, um, that we, we did get some pushback on that. Like, why do you need to have a paid committee? And um, I took some phone calls to high, high up leadership um, and, and some support from Federal Highways. And once they understood where we were coming from on this, then we were able to, you know, get resolution and move forward. But, um, yeah, it, not everyone in the industry. That's not industry standard yet. And I hope, I hope that as we show how successful this can be in, in creating more authentic engagement um, and reaching people that we otherwise couldn't reach, that it does um, not only benefit this project, but helps influence the, the, the industry, frankly. Um, on the, the Olympic question, um, I've said from a transportation perspective that uh, probably the two biggest, most important projects to get us Olympic ready are the double tracking of Front Runner and then the, the TechLink tracks expansion. Um, and those I think are already on a really good track. Um, but the, the east-west connectivity as far as serving our residents and having Salt Lake City itself be Olympic ready uh, will be really important. And so I, I do think that that is this looming deadline that creates an extra sense of urgency. Before I pass it over to Dugan, I do, one of the things I hope comes out of this too is an ability to educate and inform our neighbors about some things. You know, anytime I get a question about Redwood Road, it's like, yes, but like it's not our road and, and the layers of difficulty when we're just dealing with the state, you know, yeah. let alone, you know, anything else. Um, and I just, I think with all of these things, it's, it's just like what we were talking about with the park, setting realistic expectations for people. We might get a recommendation that we do a $16 billion facelift that takes all of the infrastructure and buries it underground, right? Like, and I, I mean, I would love it too, right? But like setting realistic expectations and priorities out of it is going to be really important to me as well, especially for my neighbors who like, I, I just, I, there is literally no time of the day I can be out where that train is not a constant albatross around my neck. So, you know, as we adjust those, as we get these results, I would just love to see educational pieces, informative pieces that help our neighbors understand the true nature of where we're going and what's possible. Councilmember Dugan. Thank you very much. And thank you, Joe and, and John, for all this. And, and Joe, for your study that you did, you know, last year uh, with the city and, and working through all this. And I appreciate that. And I love the comments about the, the timeline. Uh, and, you know, we have a 24 month timeline and we have to be very deliberate with it. Just as you said, and we got to make sure that we're seeing our, we understand we have blind spots and we just need to make sure that we can, you know, move those away and, and we have a good, good vision. My question is on the uh, how we track this project. So at month 18, we go, oh, this is going to take us another year. How do we make sure that we're on the, on the timeline so that we are completed with it in 24 months? And if we have off ramps we can get funding for earlier, we do that as early as, as, uh, as possible, but deliberately also as possible. And so how do we keep track of that? And how do we... Uh, how do you keep us informed on a monthly basis, you know, with a written report? How, how are we going to do that to make sure that we're, don't come out to 24 months and go, oh, no, now it's going to be 36 before we have a, a decision. And, and, and I, I can't, we can't afford that. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I'll let Joe talk about some of the, some of the details on the um, uh, project management. Um, one of the, the, the things that we set up with UDOT um, for them to be the, take over as the recipient for us to um, onboard the money. Um, we did hire um, a, a really stellar uh, program manager 
to, to oversee things, who has a reputation for really driving things forward. And, um, and, and then internally, obviously, this, we're very motivated to, to keep this thing on, on track. Um, we will uh, provide as many updates as, as you would like and in any format that, um, that works for you. Uh, we want to make sure that you feel like you are um, fully informed throughout the entire process, but we'll, we'll be looking at a variety of, of, of formats to make sure that, that everyone is updated. Um, but do you have anything else to add, Joe? Oh, just, just to acknowledge that it really is a challenge because we're sort of beginning with a, you know, an open-ended question, um, and then we really do want to get somewhere, and we want to get somewhere that has a you know, high likelihood of becoming successful infrastructure. Um, so it's something that you know, I think is re deeply concerning to me um, and something that we're just going to have to be really intentional with as, as we move forward. Council Member Pui. Just uh, quickly, I, as far as updates, I would love some updates. I also don't want to create a lot more work that sort of takes away from <laughs> other pieces, but I would love some you know, updates as you see moments or in, the, in your process that you know, are important that maybe our community will be excited to hear. Um, I, you know, that to me will be good. Uh, it, you know, so I don't want to give you a specific, uh, you know, windows of time to, to come up with updates. I, I trust your department uh, a lot, and I have seen uh, how committed you are to, to move forward. Um, and as far as your comment re regarding the, how successful this uh, reconnecting communities uh, projects nationwide and and they're seeing the success of it um, I, and you're right I think that it, you know in my engagement with other municipal municip municipalities and, and you know I have made quite a bit of friends in other cities they are telling me that is changing communities for the good uh, and it's huge and I'm sure that uh, that's not you know being ignored uh, the, the only piece I'm concerned about is the funding and passing any uh, substantial funding in Congress uh, is, uh, regardless of which administration is on there, uh, it, it will be uh, very challenging. So certainly to me, I love that you mentioned that there may be some off-ramps, not that the, the main things are not going to be studied, and, and, but there may be some smaller goals that we can potentially seek funding for in the meantime. So that to me gives me hope. Uh, and. Maybe I'm too much of an incrementalist at heart um, because I want, my community is asking for some changes. Certainly there is a lot of big changes that we can study uh, forever um, and find the perfect solution but then not have anything uh, to, to make it happen. So ultimately, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think to build on that, um, I, I love, I consider myself also an incrementalist and so I appreciate that. Um, kind of sometimes you have to be just really practical and just make progress even if you don't get everything you want immediately right and and, and especially in the transportation world um, I feel very confident that there will be opportunities for that here uh, you know and I feel like like the the train foe um, is a, a very small but important step like that sort of stuff but you know from that all the way up to you know just burying everything um, but I, I think that there there will be a lot of bite-sized pieces that we'll be able to um, really get after uh, immediately. <laughs> all right, Council, anything else? All right, thank you all very much. All right, so uh, now we are at the point of the report of the Chair and Vice Chair. Vice Chair, do you have anything? No, thank you. All right, well, for me, we um, want to let everyone know that at 5.30 p.m., we have tacos from Rancho Market and churros from San Diablo for uh, anyone who's here. So please join us for dinner. Uh, at 6 p.m., Chitra Kavya Dance will perform a type of Indian classical dance with a specialization in South Indian Barumtanium movement as a means of visual poetry. I apologize to my South Asian friends. I did not, my pronunciation leaves something to be desired. Um, also, today is National Voter Registration Day. Please go next door and register to vote if you are not. Um, chair, or Executive Director, <laughs> do you have anything? <laughs> All right. Uh, then we uh, need a closed session, please, for a strategy session to discuss collective bargaining. 
We will move the closed session to the green room, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And when we return, we will be adjourned. So Madam can Chair. I get a motion for a strategy session to discuss collective bargaining? Chair. And advice of counsel. Chair, motion to enter a closed session uh, for, a strategy, for a strategy session to discuss collective bargaining mm -hmm. and, and advise the council. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Lopez Chavez, a second from Mano. Any discussion? I'll roll call Young. Yes. Puy? Yes. Mano? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Lopez Chavez? Aye. Dugan? Yes. And I'm yes. That's unanimous. When we return, we'll be adjourned. Please join us for tacos. <laughs>